All right, everyone, settle down, said the company commander to the around 100 soldiers scattered in the conference room. I know you all have a lot of questions why we are suddenly being called up. I heard they finally discovered aliens, whispered one of the privates, a little bit too loudly to the Lance Corporal next to him. Be quiet, warned the Corporal next to him, and the private in question received a very stern look by the company sergeant. Yes, it is true. The Space Force has made contact with sapient extraterrestrials just beyond Alpha Centauri around a month ago, said the commander, and the company sergeant signalled to the specialist sitting at the computer in the corner of the room behind the commander. After fiddling with the remote for a bit, the projector mounted to the ceiling finally turned on, and a PowerPoint presentation showed a map of the Alpha Centauri system on the fabric screen behind the commander. Ah, there it is, he said, and turned back to the company. On 2nd of April, 2232, at around 2300 Zulu time, the SMS Berlin and his carrier formation intercepted a spacecraft of unknown origin 0.2 light years beyond the Alpha Centauri system. The vessels were ordered to halt and stopped 0.1 light years from the system after fighter craft were launched and the carrier group arranged a defensive formation while charging their weapons. The commander looked behind him to see the still image of the map and the specialist, suddenly realising his mistake. Harley pressed the spacebar to show markers for both the Allied and unknown contacts. The commander nodded, semi-contently, and then looked back at the specialist who then pressed the spacebar again to show a picture of the three intruding crafts. It looked like some sort of solar sailor, a technology the Empire quickly abandoned when the first test of jump drives had been successful. The only reason they existed at all was to make more economically cheaper trips between stellar bodies while well, the jump drives were still in development. Now they are mostly luxury items like any old yacht drifting around Terra seaports. After a week of command and the unknowns to establish proper communications, a new ship entered the space behind the first group. This time, the specialist picked up his cue on time, and a picture of a similar spaceship popped up. Going by our terms, if the others were Corvettes, then this would have been a ship of the line under the Brits. With its substantial size and with its shields raised, the fleet had to assume an ambush and was about to fire its main guns when a transmission finally reached them. Without looking away, the commander gave a small signal behind his back and the soldier dragged an open MP4 file over to the mirrored screen. There was only a black screen showing subtitles. VS. Secret. Transcript. 9th of April, 1456. SMS Berg. Receiving transmission from unknown. Stop engagement, said a growling voice in broken English. This is Captain Bishop of the frigate SMS Berg. Identify yourselves immediately and declare your intentions or we will be forced to open fire. <clears throat> from the <clears throat> assembly, we bid peace. The name of the ship, or maybe it was the captain's name, as well as that of the assembly, was not understandable. Not due to interference in the comlink, but rather that if someone would try to write it down, they would probably give up and smash their head on the keyboard and have a passable result. After that, the transcript stopped. That is all we're allowed to disclose from this conversation, but in the following days we received instructions on how to construct our own versions of these devices here, said the commander, and lifted up what seemed to be normal Bluetooth earpieces. These are outfitted with the most up-to-date translation software we can muster up, and will be issued to each and every one of you in the coming days. As to why, I'll get to shortly, he said, and put the Universal Translator down on the table next to him. After this little wonder of technology was finished, communicating with the Xenos became much easier, and eventually we were offered a spot in this galactic assembly. Think of it as the UN of the Milky Way. But in order to join... Every new member must first show their military capabilities, so they can judge if we can be of use during a galactic-wide NATO Article 5. They have even been so kind as to show us what their state-of-the-art tactics and equipment looks like. With another small gesture and a quick press of the spacebar, a picture was shown on the screen. It showed a tall and quite lanky humanoid with grey and partially textured skin, ankle-high boots, tight trousers and a coat topped off with a tall hat. Science fiction came true. They still use line tactics. They even dress like the Napoleonic era Frenchmen. I can see the expression on your faces. Yes, it's true. 
began the commander, and quickly gestured to the specialist in a video of line infantry, firing a volley of what can only be called laser muskets, or rather, plasma muskets. From what one could tell, there was some sort of exchangeable energy cell in the back, where the hammer should have been, and the metal round pitch it had no other way to get into the rifle other than through the muzzle. They still fight like it's 1835, and somehow they are the dominant empire in the galaxy. It's their proven tactic of choice. The navy also operates on a broadside tactic and can barely fire past visual range. While most of the older enlisted just burst out laughing, the commander in the NCO ranks tried to at least somewhat keep a straight face. In light of this development, or lack thereof, he added under his breath, before clearing his throat and continuing, Command has decided to fight them like the French, just a century later. The exact wording was that we have been ordered to extensively use artillery and entrenchment to fight them in a simulated battle on one of their fortress walls closest to us. Reason being is one of our proven tactics. A hand raised amidst the enlisted, and the commander nods to him. Do you have a question? Yes, sir. Um, do we at least get to keep our gear, or are we using our proven equipment? He said adding quotation marks with his hands. Well, not entirely. Since Command needed to retrofit weapons to comply with their method of combat simulation, they helped themselves to some old stocks still left in some warehouses. And don't tell me we are going to fight with three century old MGs and the rifles from the Guard Battalion, interrupted one of the Star Sergeants. And steel helmets and grey coats, added the Commander, followed by loud groaning from most of the soldiers but they were all being redesigned for better utility and comfort, or so I've been told. There was a short pause and briefly looked away, which was probably his way of trying to gather himself. Break, he announced, and took a quick breath before looking back at his soldiers and continuing. After this equipment has been issued to all of you, we will transfer to this fortress world called Hai Shun, he said, looking at the map of said planet. We are tasked with setting up a supply point in this city that houses a somewhat adequate spaceport after it has been secured by forward operating forces, while the Shundanex, he pronounced slowly, prepare their forces in this fortress, he said, pointing to a basic star fortress as seen on the American East Coast. After we have linked up with the security detail and have set up HQ and logistics, all personnel not strictly required for operating them will join the infantry forces and march towards the enemy and secure as many villages as we can before making contact with the enemy. After a front line has been established, we are ordered to entrench ourselves and hold the line until the next enemy offensive while artillery is being set up in the rear area. With all due respect, but this battle plan sounds like it's being drawn up from the History Geek sons of the staff, instead of by actual leading personnel, said the corporal sitting in the front row. Why the hell don't we just blast them to pieces with precision guided missiles and call it a day? Good question. The reason Commander's given was... Let me see, he said. I looked around a pile of papers next to the computer. Here. It is to be assumed that the Galactic Assembly will try to adapt or counter our equipment and strategies, and in order to keep our apparent military advantage, it is crucial to not openly show the full capability of our navy and armies. End quote. So someone in the staff said, you need to appear weak when you are strong, and then let their kid think of the battle plan? I will not give a statement about this. It took about two weeks for the battalion to be fully equipped with their state-of-the-art sim equipment, another two weeks to reach the staging ground, two days to set up the HQ fully, and two more days until contact was made around 100 kilometers out from the city. A forward command post was set up. The artillery was towed in. The trenches were dug. The first engagement happened while the company was still securing the village they were in. They were going from house to house when recon radioed in. One enemy infantry battalion with artillery support, four kilometers northeast, moving southwest. Immediately, the company began preparing for the attack. Two thirds of the company took positions in the buildings, while the rest crept to ambush positions in the forest to the east. The enemy stopped 100 meters from the village, probably waiting to be approached by the enemy line. They didn't expect that they were already staring at it, and they were being stared at. With a whistle, the attack commenced, while the barricaded forces in the village opened fire with rifles and two MGs. The ambush group in the forest started by throwing grenades into the confused ranks. The massacre was total. After the commander got hit by one of the grenades, the fire started breaking and routed, but between the crossfire there were no confirmed survivors. 
At least survivors in the simulation sense. Though the force of the projectiles and grenades was very much real, this was of course more of a paintball match than anything. After the fighting was done, and nothing dared to move for quite some time, some of the groups in the village were diverted to inspect the casualties, and looking for possible prisoners, while the others held the position. After everything was said and done, they rounded up 14 prisoners that were barely alive, while the bruised and beaten dead limped back to the fortress to be ferried back into orbit. With that, the lines were drawn, and the enemy was already shaken. By the end of the day, when the first trenches were dug, the enemy approached again. When the lookout spotted the lions marching at around 2 kilometers out from the front line, everyone stopped what they were doing and lined up on the steps of the trenches. The NCOs walked up and down the trenches barking orders and giving speeches like they were the heroes, or the antagonist to the enlisted protagonist in a war movie. When the enemy approached the open fire line, the trigger fingers of the soldiers started to itch, but they were specifically ordered to hold fire. Those directly next to the radio operators knew why. And a few seconds later everyone knew, when a whistling sound scraped across the sky before a hole was blown into the middle of the line, then another and another. Artillery cease fire, shouted one of the radio operators. And not soon after the whistle sounded and every rifle and MG in the trench started firing. Again, the enemy started routing this time with a minimal amount of survivors They managed to get away. When nothing seemed to move anymore, some soldiers returned to expanding the trench. A few hours later, the fire guard asked his NCO, Why is it that we just dug ourselves in here? Are we supposed to be on the offensive? Or are we just counting on them to just throw everything at us bit by bit until there's no one left? The way I understand the plan for command, we are going to hold this position until reinforcements arrive. And depending on if they start digging too or not, this will either turn into Verdun, or a relaxed car march during the span of around a day. Hold on, what reinforcements? Panzer Battalion 467. The battles went on for two whole more weeks. Grasslands and forests turned into no man's land, guarded by trenches on either side. The Xenos were quick to adapt. When the soldiers of the northern trenches broke out of their positions to flank the main attacking force, spotted by the now present air reconnaissance, they were met with a hail of musket fire coming from a newly dug trench. The first time they were met with heavy casualties during this entire operation. From then on, one thing leads to another. The Xenos expanded their trenches to cover the whole front. The Terrans fortified theirs. Fallback positions were added to the trench system. Bunkers were built and forward logistics posts were set up and expanded in the villages behind them. With that, the lovingly called Battle of the New Somme began, even though the nearest river went past 15 kilometers south of the front. The small field cannons, the Schuldenex, which comprised nearly the whole artillery capability, weren't suited for this kind of warfare. Their shells lacked explosive power, or fragmentation, and they lacked either the range or the elevation needed to fire them from suitable cover. And those that operated on the edge of their trenches were often not well protected, and the crews of the artillery were often easy pickings for snipers until they expanded their positions to either construct cover around them, which limited their angle of effect, or give them enough space to operate the cannon inside the trenches, although that made acquiring and staying accurate on target significantly more difficult for them. On the other side, however, the quite imposing replicas of the 21cm artillery, 16, had the enemy lines with incredible precision. Although in order to achieve it, there was some cheating involved. Target acquisition was done via laser designation by either planes or frontline troops. But instead of a seven day bombardment, the enemy didn't hold out two entire days. Some didn't even wait for a pause in the barrage of HE and shrapnel shells, storming out after the shell shock took the better of them. When command finally decided they had enough, they gave the artillery order to cease fire. Eerie silence hung in the air for what felt like hours, at least into a long shrill tone cut through the air, followed by cries and shouts as the soldiers charged across the no man's land. They jumped into the opposing trenches, slaughtering disoriented and broken enemies with lead and steel. Those who found themselves too close to the attackers were met with their shovels and clubs. Those who thought they were safe in bunkers soon found a stick grenade on the floor next to them. On the other end of the attacking front, there only sounded the echoes of death and destruction from far away. No whistle sounded, but instead a low growling sound crept ever closer from behind the trenches. 
The Shudanek's officers had by then managed to muster their forces, dragging them out of their bunkers if need be to man their trenches. They kept careful watch over the barren and muddy wasteland that once was a beautiful meadow only weeks before. The sound was unsettling. They were anticipating a charge, after all, but they saw neither helmets nor rifles in the trenches, just this growling, growing ever louder. The louder it became, the closer it came, the better they could hear that this sound didn't only come from one direction, from one thing. They could hear there was multiple. The first thing the commander saw was the thick columns of black smoke approaching them. Then they felt the ground shudder, and then they saw the beast responsible for all of it. The hunks of metal dragged themselves forward, either with tracks going around their whole sides or hidden underneath the sloped metal boxes. And not soon after they climbed over the hills, their cannons hurled death towards the frightened enemies with deafening explosions. Those that didn't flee desperately tried to fend off these technological abominations with anything they had, but their rifle fire glanced off their armour, and their cannons only dented their hull. It was a massacre. After their lines were broken, and the soldiers and tanks stormed towards the fort, the enemy surrendered. After the shooter next generals admitted to their total and overwhelming defeat, they only wanted to know one thing. Why? Why did they push war to such an extent? Why did they excel at war the way they did? Why did they unleash such horrors on their enemies? The only official answer they ever received was the following sentences. We went easy on you. Pray you don't see the full extent of war by our definition. 